The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle. Chapter 8. Little John and the Tanner of Blythe. One fine day, not long after Little John had left abiding with the sheriff, and had come back with his worship's cook to the Merry Greenwood, as has just been told, Robin Hood and a few chosen fellows of his band lay upon the soft sward beneath the greenwood tree where they dwelled. The day was warm and sultry, so that while most of the band were scattered through the forest upon this mission and upon that, these few stout fellows lay lazily beneath the shade of the tree in the soft afternoon, passing jests among themselves and telling merry stories with laughter and mirth. All the air was laden with the bitter fragrance of May, and all the busky shades of the woodlands beyond rang with the sweet song of birds, the throstle cock, the cuckoo, and the wood pigeon, and with the song of birds mingled the cool sound of the gurgling brook that leapt up upon the forest shades, and ran fretting amid its rough grey stones across the sunlit open glade before the trysting tree. And a fair sight was that half-score of tall, stout yeomen, all clad in Lincoln green, lying beneath the broad-spreading branches of the great oak-tree, amid the quivering leaves of which the sunlit shivered and fell in dancing patches upon the grass. Suddenly Robin Hood smote his knee. "'By St. Dunstan!' quoth he. "'I had nigh forgot that quarter-day cometh on apace, and yet no cloth of Lincoln green in all our store. It must be looked to, and that in quick season.' Come, busk thee, little John, stir those lazy bones of thine, for thou must get thee straight away to our good gossip, the draper of Hugh Longshacken of Ancaster. Bid him send us straight away twenty score yards of fair cloth of Lincoln green, and mayhap the journey may take some of the fat from off thy bones that thou hast gotten from lazy living at our dear sheriff's. Nay, muttered little John, for he had heard so much upon this score that he was sore upon the point. Nay, truly, mayhap, I may have more flesh upon my joints than I once had, yet, flesh or no flesh, I doubt not that I could still hold my place putting upon a narrow bridge against a air yeoman in Sherwood, or Nottinghamshire, for that matter, even that, even though he had no more fat upon his bones than thou hast, good master. At this reply a great shout of laughter went up, and all looked at Robin Hood, for each man knew that Little John spoke of a certain fight that happened between their master and himself, through which they first became acquainted. "'Nay,' quoth Robin Hood, laughing louder than all, "'Heaven forbid that I should doubt thee, "'for I care for no taste of thy staff myself, little John. "'I must needs own that there are those of my band "'can handle a seven-foot staff more deftly than I. "'Yet no man in all Nottinghamshire "'can draw a grey goose shaft with my fingers. "'Nevertheless, a journey to Ancaster may not be ill for thee. "'So go thou as I bid, and thou hast best be this very evening.' For since thou hast abided at the sheriff's, many know thy face, and if thou goest in broad daylight, thou mayest get thyself into a coil with some of his worship's men-at-arms. Bide thou here till I bring thee money to pay our good hue. I warrant he hath no better customers in all Nottinghamshire than we. So saying, Robin left them and entered the forest. Not far from the trysting tree was a great rock, in which a chamber had been hewn, the entrance being barred by a massive oaken door, two palms' breadth in thickness, studded about with spikes and fastened with a great padlock. This was the treasure-house of the band, and thither Robin Hood went, and unlocking the door, entered the chamber from which he brought forth a bag of gold, which he gave to Little John, to pay Hugh Longshanks withal, for the cloth of Lincoln Green. Then up got Little John, and, taking the bag of gold which he thrust into his bosom, he strapped a girdle upon his loins, took a stout pike-staff full seven feet long in his hand, and set forth upon his journey. So he strode, whistling along the leafy forest path that led to Fossey Way, turning neither to the right hand nor the left, until at last he came to where the path branched, leading on the one hand toward Fossey Way, and on the other, as well Little John knew, to the merry Blue Boar Inn. Here Little John suddenly ceased whistling and stopped in the middle of the path. First he looked up, and then he looked down, and then, tilting his cap over one eye, he slowly scratched the back part of his head, for thus it was. At the sight of these two roads, two voices began to alarm within him, the one crying, "'There lies the road to the Blue Boar Inn, a can of brown October, and a merry night with sweet companions such as thou mayest find there.' The other, there lies the way to Ancaster, and the duty thou art sent upon. Now, the first of these two voices was far the louder, for little John had grown passing fond of good living through abiding at the sheriff's house. So presently, looking up into the blue sky, across which bright clouds were sailing, like silver boats and swallows skimming in circling flight, quoth he, I fear it will rain this evening, so I and stop at the blue boar till it passes by. 
for I know my good master would not have me wet to the skin. So, without more ado, off he strode down the path that lay the way of his likings. Now there was no sign of any foul weather, but when one wishes to do a thing as little John did, one finds no lack of reasons for thy doing. Four merry wags were at the Blue Boar Inn, a butcher, a beggar, and two barefoot friars. Little John heard them singing from afar as he walked through the hush of the mellow twilight that was now falling over hill and dale. Right glad were they to welcome such a merry blade as Little John. Fresh cans of ale were brought, and with jest and song and merry tales the hours slipped away on fleeting wings. None thought of time or tide till the night was so far gone that Little John put by the thought of setting forth upon his journey again that night, and so bided at the Blue Boar Inn until the morrow. Now, it was an ill piece of luck for Little John that he left his duty for his pleasure, and he paid a great score for it, as we are all apt to do in the same case, as you shall see. Up he rose at dawn of the next day, and, taking his stout pike-staff in his hand, he set forth upon his journey once more, as though he would make up for lost time. In the good town of Blythe there lived a stout tanner, celebrated far and near for feats of strength and many tough bouts at wrestling and the quarter-staff. For five years he had held the mid-country champion belt for wrestling, till the great Adam O'Lincoln cast him in the ring and broke one of his ribs. But at the quarter-staff he had never yet met his match in all the country about. Besides all this, he dearly loved the longbow, and a sly jaunt into the forest when the moon was full and the dun deer in season, so that the king's ranger kept a shrewd eye upon him and his doings. For Arthur a Bland's house was apt to have a plenty of meat in it that was more like venison than the law allowed. Now, Arthur had been to Nottingham Town the day before Little John set forth on his errand, there to sell a half-score of tanned cowhides. At the dawn of the same day that Little John left the inn, he started from Nottingham homeward for Blythe. His way led all in the dewy morn, past the verge of Sherwood Forest, where the birds were welcoming the lovely day with a great and merry jubilee. Across the tanner's shoulders was slung a stout quarterstaff, ever near enough to him to be gripped quickly, and on his head was a cap of double cowhide, so tough that it could hardly be cloven even by a broadsword. Now, quoth Arthur, a bland to himself, when he had come to that part of the road that cut through a corner of the forest. Hmm, no doubt at this time of year the dun deer are coming from the forest depths nigher to the open meadowlands. Mayhap I may chance to catch a sight of the dainty brown darlings thus early in the morn. For there was nothing he loved better than to look upon a tripping herd of deer, even when they could not tickle their ribs with a clothyard shaft. Accordingly, quitting the path, he went peeping this way and that through the underbrush, spying now here and now there with all the wiles of a master of woodcraft, and of one who had more than once donned a doublet of Lincoln Green. Now, as little John stepped blithely along, thinking of nothing but of such things as the sweetness of the hawthorn buds that bedecked the hedgerows or gazing upward at the lark, that springing from the dewy grass hung aloft on quivering wings in the yellow sunlight, pouring forth its song that fell like falling star from the sky, his luck led him away from the highway, not far from the spot where Arthur Abland was peeping this way and that through the leaves of the thickets. Hearing a rustling of the branches, little John stopped and presently caught sight of the brown cowhide cap of the tanner moving among the bushes. "'I do much wonder,' quoth little John to himself, "'what yon knave is after that he should go thus peeping and peering about. I verily believe that yon scurvy varlet is no better than a thief, and cometh here after our own and the good king's dun deer. For, by much roving in the forest, Little John had come to look upon all the deer in Sherwith as belonging to Robin Hood and his band as much as to the good King Harry. Nay, quoth he again after a time, this matter must e'en be looked into. So, quitting the high road, he also entered the thickets and began spying around after stout Arthur a bland. So for a long time they both of them went hunting about, Little John after the tanner and the tanner after the deer. At last, Little John trod upon a stick which snapped under his foot, whereupon, hearing the noise, the tanner turned quickly and caught sight of the omen. Seeing that the tanner had spied him out, Little John put a bold face upon the matter. Hello, quoth he, what art thou doing here, thou naughty fellow? Who art thou that comest ranging Sherwood's paths? In very sooth thou hast an evil cast of countenance, and I do think, truly, that thou art no better than a thief, and comest after our good king's deer. Nay! quoth the tanner boldly, for thou taken by surprise, he was not a man to be frightened by big words. Thou liest in thy teeth. I am no thief, but an honest craftsman. As for my countenance, it is what it is, and, for the matter of that, thine own is none too pretty, thou saucy fellow. Ha! 
quoth Little John, in a great loud voice. Wouldst thou give me back talk? Now I have a great part of a mind to crack thy pate for thee. I would have thee know, fellow, that I am, as it were, one of the king's foresters. Leastwise, muttered to himself, I and my friends do take good care of our good sovereign's dear. I care not who thou art, answered the bold tanner, and unless thou hast many more of thy kind by thee, thou canst never make Arthur a bland cry, mercy. Is it so? cried Little John in a rage. Now, by my faith, thou saucy rogue, thou tying hath led thee into a pit thou wilt have a sorry time getting out of, for I will give thee such a drubbing as ne'er hast thou had in all thy life before. Take thy staff in thy hand, fellow, for I will not smite an unarmed man. Ha! Mary, come up with a moraine, cried the tanner, for he too had talked himself into a fume. Big words ne'er killed so much as a mouse. Who art thou that talkest so freely of cracking the head of Arthur a bland? If I do not tan thy hide this day as near I tanned a calf's hide in all my life before, split my staff into skewers for lamb's flesh, and call me no more than a brave man. Now look to thyself, fellow. Stay, said Little John. Let us first measure our cudgels. I do reckon my staff longer than thine, and I would not take advantage of by thee for even so much as an inch. Nay, I pass not for length, answered the tanner. My staff is long enough to knock down a calf, so look to thyself, fellow, I say again. So, without more ado, each gripped his staff in the middle, and with fell and angry looks they came slowly together. Now news had been brought to Robin Hood how that little John, instead of doing his bidding, had passed by duty for pleasure, and so had stopped overnight with merry company at the Blue Boar Inn, instead of going straight to Ancaster. So, being vexed to his heart by this, he set forth at dawn of day to seek Little John at the Blue Boar, or at least to meet the yeoman on the way and ease his heart of what he thought of the matter. As thus he strode along in anger, putting together the words he would use to chide Little John, he heard of a sudden loud and angry voices, as of men in a rage, passing fell words back and forth from one another. At this, the Robin Hood stopped and listened. Surely, quoth he to himself, that is Little John's voice, and he is talking in anger also. Methinks the other is strange to my ears. Now heaven forfend that my good trusty Little John should have fallen into the hands of the king's rangers. I must see to this matter and that quickly. Thus spoke Robin Hood to himself, all his anger passing away like a breath from the window-pane, at the thought that perhaps his trusty right-hand man was in some danger of his life. So cautiously he made his way through the thickets whence the voices came, and, pushing aside the leaves, peeped into the little open space where the two men, staff in hand, were coming slowly together. Ha! quoth little Robin to himself. Here is a merry sport afoot. Now I would give three golden angles from my own pocket if yon stout fellow would give little John a right sound drubbing. It would please me to see him well thumped for having failed in my bidding. I fear me, though, there is but poor chance of my seeing such a pleasant sight. So saying, he stretched himself at length upon the ground, that he might not only see the sport the better, but that he might enjoy the merry sight at his ease. As you may have seen two dogs that think to fight, walking slowly round and round each other, neither cur wishing to begin the combat, so that the two stout yeomen moved slowly around, each watching for a chance to take the other unaware, and so get in the first blow. At last Little John struck like a flash, and rap the tanner met the blow and turned it aside, and then smote back at Little John, who also turned the blow, and so this mighty battle began. Then, up and down and back and forth they trod, the blows falling so thick and fast that, at a distance, one would have thought that a half-score of men were fighting. Thus they fought for nigh a half an hour, until the ground was all ploughed up with digging of their heels, and their breathing grew laboured like the ox in the furrow. But Little John suffered the most, for he had become unused to such stiff labour, and his joints were not as supple as they had been before he went to dwell with the sheriff. All this time... Robin Hood lay beneath the bush, rejoicing at such a comely bout of quarterstaff. "'By my faith,' quoth he to himself, "'never had I thought to see little John so evenly matched in all my life. Belike, though, he would have overcome yon fellow before this had and been in a former trim.' At last little John saw his chance, and, throwing all the strength he felt going from him into one blow that might have felled an ox, he struck at the tanner with might and main. And now did the tanner's cowhide cap stand him in good stead, and but for it he might never have held staff in hand again. 
As it was, the blow he caught beside the head was so shrewd that it sent him staggering across the little grade, so that if little John had had the strength to follow up his vantage it would have been ill for stout Arthur. But he regained himself quickly, and at arm's length struck a back a blow at little John, and this time the struck reached its mark, and down went little John at full length, his cudgel flying from his hand as he fell. Then, raising his staff, stout Arthur dealt him another blow upon the ribs. Hold! roared little John. Wilt thou strike a man when he is down? Ay, merry would I, quoth the tanner, giving him another thwack with his staff. Stop! roared little John. Help! Hold, I say! I yield! I yield me, I say, good fellow! Hast thou had enough? asked the tanner, grimly, holding his staff aloft. Ay, merry, and more than enough! And thou dost own that I am the better man of the two? Yea, truly, and a murrain seize thee, said little John, the first aloud and the last to his beard. Then thou mayst go thy way, and thank thy patron saint that I am a merciful man, said the tanner. A plague, o oh, such mercy as thine, said little John, sitting up and feeling his ribs where the tanner had cudgelled him. I make my vow, my ribs feel as though every one of them were broken in twain. I tell thee, good fellow, I did think there was never a man in all Nottinghamshire could do to me what thou hast done this day. And so thought I also, cried Robin Hood, bursting out of the thicket and shouting with laughter till the tears ran down his cheeks. O oh, man, O oh, man, said he, as well as he could for his mirth, I didst go over like a bottle knocked from a wall. I did see the whole merry bout, and never did I think to see thee yield thyself so, hand and foot to any man in all merry England. I was seeking thee to chide thee for leaving my bidding undone, but thou hast been paid all I owed thee, full measure pressed down and overflowing by this good fellow. Mary, a did reach out his arm full length while thou stood gaping at him, and with a pretty rap tumbled thee over as never had I seen one tumbled before. So spoke bold Robin, and all the time little John sat upon the ground, looking as though he had sour curds in his mouth. What may be thy name, good fellow? said Robin, next turning to the tanner. Men do call me Arthur a Bland, spoke up the tanner boldly, and now what may be thy name? Ha! Arthur a Bland, quoth Robin. I have heard thy name before, good fellow. Thou didst break the crown of a friend of mine at the fair at Eli last October. The folk there call him Jack o' Nottingham. We call him Will Scalthlock. This poor fellow whom thou hast so belabored is counted the best hand at the quarterstaff in all merry England. His name is Little John, and mine Robin Hood. How? cried the tanner. Art thou indeed the great Robin Hood, and this is the famous Little John? Marry, had I known who thou art, I would never have been so bold as to lift my hand against thee. Let me help thee to thy feet, good master Little John, and let me brush the dust from off thy coat. Nay, quoth Little John testily, at the same time rising carefully as though his bones had been made of glass. I can help myself, good fellow, without thy aid, and let me tell thee, had it not been for the vile cowskin cap of thine, it would have been ill for thee this day. At this Robin laughed again, and turning to the tanner, he said, Wilt thou join my band, good Arthur, for I make my vow thou art one of the stoutest men that ever mine eyes beheld. Will I join thy band? cried the tanner joyfully. A hey, merry will I, hey for a merry life, cried he, leaping aloft and snapping his fingers, and hey for the life I love. Anyway, with tan bark and filthy vats and foul cowhides, I will follow thee to the ends of the earth, good master, and not a herd of dun deer in all the forest but shall know the sound of the twang of my bowstring. As for thee, little John, said Robin, turning to him and laughing, thou wilt start once more for Ancaster, and will go part way with thee, for I will not have thee turn again to either the right hand or the left till thou hast fairly gotten away from Sherwood. There are other inns that thou knowest yet hereabouts. Thereupon, leaving the thickets, they took once more to the highway, and departed upon their business. End of chapter 8 Of chapter 8 of chapter 8.